Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the second part in the series of Jesus versus Paul, or Paul versus Jesus. You see, the teachings of Paul and the teachings of Jesus often look like they contradict each other or go against each other. And so we're giving you proof from the Bible, and we're looking at a comparative study between the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of Paul. And so far we've seen that the teachings of Paul show very clearly in the Bible that he did not believe that Jesus was God. He fully understood the fact that Jesus was simply a messenger of Allah. We understand the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, simply to be a messenger of Allah, and this is what Paul understood. We also saw that Paul believed that God was immortal, and God is immortal. Therefore, if God is immortal, how can Jesus be God and die for three days and then be resurrected from the dead? Mortal means that you cannot die. All you have to do is pick up your dictionary and have a look what the word immortal says. You will not see that it means you can die and then be resurrected three days later. Immortal means you cannot die. It is impossible. It is totally unimaginable for someone who claims to be immortal to die. You see what happens today? We have vampire movies and we have movies about lichen, which are werewolves. And these are supposed immortals, but you can kill them with a stake through the heart or you can kill them with a silver bullet. This is not immortal. Immortal means even if you are shot with a silver bullet, or stabbed with a stake through the heart, you will not be able to die. You see, God, Allah, is unable to be affected by human illnesses and sicknesses, crucifixions, whippings, or death, because He is God. He would not be able to be even be in the same atmosphere, let alone the same presence of such atrocities and such things. So, if we have a look at the dictionary, we can see very clearly that immortal is something that is not any, none of us human beings will be able to see until Allah permits us to have that ability. At this point in our life, we, we are born, we get older and older and older, and we will die. Now, if we have a look back into the Bible, we can see that the Bible tells you many times uh, that Paul and Jesus had differences of opinion on something, or different opinion on, on certain matters. But before we get into that, we're going to go back and look what Paul actually says about Jesus and God. You see, everyone who believes that, that Jesus died and was God and was resurrected back from death to life, hasn't really understood the Bible at all. Because God is immortal. And we need to understand that, we need to get that, and this is what we need to teach the Christian missionary. So, if we have a look and, and we believe that, that Jesus and, and God are separate, we need to have a look what Paul understood by it. How did Paul try to explain it to the early Christians? How did Paul try to explain it to the people that were around him at that time? Paul knew that many thousands of people had seen the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, or many people had seen uh, Jesus Christ after his supposed death and resurrection. They had seen him afterwards walking around. And so when he said this, he knew that there were going to be people who were going to argue and say, but how can God and Jesus be the same if Jesus died and was resurrected? So he knew that at that time there weren't any people around that believed that Jesus was God. All the people that he was writing to, all the people that were around at the time of Paul, knew that Jesus was just a prophet. They knew that he was not God. So only today do we have problems with this text. Only today do Christians have a problem with trying to avoid this text when talking. When they talk to you, they won't show you this text where he separates man and, and from God because they don't want you to see that. Now if we go to Acts, so if we go to the book of Acts in the Bible, we will see that in chapter 9, verse 22, it says that uh, Paul was teaching a teaching that uh, Jesus and God were separate from each other, not separated from each other, but separate from each other. They weren't the same person. This is why uh, Paul went about teaching that Jesus was not God and that he was purely God's Messiah or God's messenger. Remember, the Messiah simply means the anointed one. When he was in Athens, Paul spoke of God as the God who made the worlds and everything in it, and he identified Jesus as the man who God appointed. In other words, if you read in Acts chapter 17, verse 24, it says, The God who made the worlds and everything in it, then he identifies Jesus as a man who God appointed. Separate. He says, I have appointed this man just like he has appointed all the prophets. There's no great mystery there. 
this is something that we as Muslims fully understand. You see, one of the great mysteries with Christians and evangelists and missionaries, and if you're watching, I don't mean to offend you, but if you're a Christian and evangelist or missionary, one of the things that you don't do with your book is you don't read it. You take the words that you see on the page and you absorb them, but you do not read them. That's why one of the greatest messages to, to the Muslim community was the first word that was given to us, and that was read. In other words, we go to the text and we pick up the Quran and we see what the Quran says. We do not go with our own ideas or our own views or our own uh, preconceived ideas. We don't have doctrines that we choose to bring with us when we open the text. We go to the text and we allow the text to speak for itself. So my challenge is to any Christians or any missionaries or evangelists that may be watching, pick up the text and read what the text says itself. So in Acts chapter 17 and verse 24, we see in the Bible, it is clear that Paul uh, saw that Jesus was not God, that he would be shocked that anyone would even read the text and believe that Jesus was God today. He would have been shocked that people have taken his writings and twisted them and changed them. Paul identified even in front of the court when he was arrested in Acts chapter 24 and verse 14. He is taken before courts and they ask him, do you say that Jesus is God? Who are you? Who is God? Who do you believe is God? And Paul says under oath, he swears, he says, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers. Who was the God of our fathers before? The God of our fathers was Allah. This is what the Jews had worshipped. They didn't worship Jesus as God. They didn't worship the Holy Spirit as God. They worshipped but one God. So he was saying that I worship the gods of our fathers. And this you read in Acts 24 and verse 14. So if you have your highlighter, Mark Acts 24 verse 14 in, in the Bible. And so when the Christians come, you say, even Paul uh, attested to this. Even Paul said, that Jesus is the servant of God, and that when we read the book of Acts, it is very clear. Now, if we look at the next part of the verse, it says, For God of our Father has glorified his servant Jesus. So the God of our Father has glorified his servant Jesus. In other words, God, Allah, has glorified, in other words, blessed the work of the prophet Isa, who is the what? The Muslim, the servant, the submissor. The submissor is Jesus. So in other words, Allah, our Father, has blessed his Muslim, Jesus. This is what we see in chapter 3 and verse 13. For Paul, the Father alone is God. For Paul, Allah alone is God. Allah is God. So for Paul, there was no problem. Paul says that this is the one God, the Father of all. And we see that in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, one God and Father of all. He doesn't say there are three gods that Jesus is part of the Godhead, that the Holy Spirit is part of Godhead. No, he says there is but one God, La Ilah. He says very clearly there is one God and one Father. Father means that there's closeness, that we are able to come close. So that's all he means, is closeness. He doesn't mean biologically. Paul did not for one minute believe that he was the Son of God as he was somehow um, miraculously um, sent from the Godhead. He just understood him as that closeness. You know, many people, as I've said before, have that expression that the people that are not even their, their biological father or mother, they call father and mother in certain cultures. For example, in Africa, in South Africa, amongst the Zulu people, if you look after somebody else's child, uh, the mother is called mother by this child, even though it's not really him, the child's mother. This is just an expression that is used. So Paul says again, for us there is but one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. He separates him again, and that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. So we see that in, uh, in the book of Acts, in the book of Ephesians, in the book of Corinthians, he's saying the same thing over and over and over. It wasn't a typo, it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't a textual error. This is something that has continued through all the text. Even Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6 to 11, is often quoted as proof that Jesus is God by the Christians. But the very passage shows that Jesus is not God. So the very uh, passages that Christians often use to prove that Jesus is God, although there were very passages that we can see if you read. If you go there with your own misconceptions and your own ideas to put doctrine, of course, you can read whatever you want into it. Like you can find a verse to prove anything. But if you read the verse in its context and see where the commas lie, see where the separation lies, you can see that there can be no other conclusion other than the fact that Jesus is not God. We are going to take a short break. And uh, when we get back from the break, we will continue to look at Paul's letter to the, the Philippians and we will see that he clearly understood that Jesus was not God. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim.
Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We'll continue this part of the talk with did Paul's letter, his uh, writings, his epistles, did they say that Jesus is God or not? So we see that we've gone through quite a bit of Paul's writings already. We've looked in Corinthians, we've looked in Ephesians, we've looked in Philippians, we've looked in the book of Acts. Almost every single book he's written, we've seen that he doesn't believe that Jesus is God. So we're still trying to find maybe there's a verse that he says, yes, Jesus is God. As we look in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6 to 11, this passage has to uh, agree with what we've seen in other verses as well in the Bible. So we often find that one verse in the Bible will be um, backed up in another verse in the Bible. So we've seen this quite often. So we see this specific concept here of Jesus being God. We find it many times in the Bible says, no, Jesus is not God. Yet the Christians and the church and the evangelists and the missionaries still believe that he is. How can they when there's so much evidence that, that this doctrine is not true? So in Isaiah 45, which is in the Old Testament, in verse 22 to 24, if we compare it to Philippians, the verse that we've just spoken about, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, here we see that God, every knee shall bow to God. Every tongue will confess that the righteousness and strength are in God alone. In other words, there's not one entity on earth, not one being on earth that will not submit to the will of Allah. And we know this as Muslims, we understand this and we accept this because this means the submissing, this uh, confessing, this bowing down is, is just one word for us and that is Islam. So we know to submit to the will of Allah. So Paul was aware that this passage that he quotes in Romans chapter 14 and verse 11, that declares every knee shall bow to the Father, every knee shall bow. This was something that he understood. This is he understood from the Old Testament, that they will bow to one God, not to many gods, not to a Trinity God, but to one God. And then even in Ephesians in chapter uh, 3 and verse 14, so uh, there's another verse as well which also says the same thing, that every knee shall bow. In the letter to the Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6 in, in the Bible, it says that the angels of God shall worship the Son. But this passage depends on Deuteronomy, which is in Old Testament. Like we did with Isaiah and we showed that they back up each other. In Hebrews when it says in, in chapter 1 and verse 6 that that the angels of God shall worship the Son, another S-O-N. They believe that this word, the capital S-O-N, refers to Jesus. This passage depends on what Deuteronomy um, chapter 32 of the Old Testament says in verse 43, and this is from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. Now we ask them, must understand that the Septuagint version of the Old Testament is no longer recognized by the Christian community. Most Christians have said that this phase cannot be found in the Old Testament of any of the other versions other than the Septuagint. And so the Christians use this word and they have selected to use the Septuagint when quoting that they must worship the Son. But this is not found in any of the other versions. It's not found in any of the other versions of the Bible. Only, it's only valid in the Septuagint version of the Bible. However, even the Septuagint version of the Bible does not say worship the Son. It says, let the angels of God worship God. It does not say worship the Son as translators have changed it. So the translators have purposely yet again, change this word where it actually reads, let the angels of God worship God. But they've changed it and they've changed the word from God to son. The Bible insists that God alone is to be worshipped. And if we look in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16, you see it says here very clearly that Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16, it says very clearly, worship Yahweh your God and serve him only. Now the word Yahweh or Jehovah or Allah is a word that was used there. So they say, worship Allah, your God, and serve him only. So Deuteronomy is a book that cannot be outdated, or if you're a Christian, you have to continue following the Old Testament, you have to follow the New Testament. And so when you read a verse like that, that says that you can only serve Allah, your God, then it is clear that Paul understood that there was only one person that you could worship, only one person that you should uh, bow down before. And that is Allah. There is only one God that you must worship. So Jesus, on whom be peace, uh, believed in this fact as well. For he also stressed this in, in the book of Luke, in chapter 4 and verse 8. You see that the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, stressed the fact. He told his followers to, to worship God and one God only. And we see that Jesus himself fell on his face and he worshipped God. And we see in, in Matthew 26 and verse 39, we see the same thing happening that Jesus worshiped God. He understood that he was not God. Now think about it for a moment. If for one second we had to buy into the myth that Jesus is God, as found in the Bible, he would have to be 
have like a bipolar disorder or, or schizophrenic because he would be talking to himself. When he's praying and he's praying out loud, he's, who is he praying to? If he is God, he would be praying to himself. So it doesn't make any logical sense, even, in the, in, even without all the text and even without all this proof that we, we are loading up, proof upon proof upon proof, to show you that this is impossible for Jesus to be God, that the concept that Christians have that Jesus is God is impossible. We can see that even without all this wealth of evidence that I've already shown you, that it just wouldn't make any sense. It just doesn't look logical that somebody would call upon himself. It wouldn't make any sense. We would think that this person is crazy. And so this, as we look through the text, we see that, that uh, God is a God of order, that Jesus was a loyal servant, that he was a prophet, that the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, was faithful to the end, even until he was taken up by Allah and, and taken to safety and prevented from, uh, from having to suffer the crucifixion. So Paul knew that Jesus worshipped God. Paul understood that Jesus was submissive to God. Paul understood that the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, worshipped God. Now, if we look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, you can see that Paul writes very clearly that Jesus worshipped God. And Paul teaches that Jesus will remain forever subservient to God. And this we see clearly spoken about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 28. It says that Paul taught that Jesus will remain forever subservient to God. He will forever remain a Muslim to God. All the writers of the Bible believe that God was not Jesus. And they all believe that Jesus was not God. Not one of the Bible writers from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelations believed that God and Jesus were the same. None of them believed that Allah and Jesus were the same. Jesus and Allah are separate. And this is not a problem that any of the Bible writers had. None of the writers had even the slightest inkling towards that. It was the scholars. It was the people who came after who decided to make this doctrine that had nothing to do with the Bible at all. The idea that Jesus is God uh, did not become part of, of the Christian belief until the Bible was written, until we had this final form. And two, uh, it was many, many centuries later that it became part of the Christian faith. It became part of the Christian faith at the Council of Nicaea. This is when the idea of, the, of uh, bringing Jesus and God together into, into one book became possible. Before that, no one even thought remotely. There's no evidence, not at all, no way to be found here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, the authors of the, of the three Gospels believed that Jesus was not God. They clearly said in Mark chapter 10 and verse 18, and Matthew um, 19 and verse 17, they made it clear that they do not believe that Jesus is God. They believed that he was the Son of God in the sense that he was a righteous person. They didn't believe he was the Son of God in any other way. Many others are referred to as the sons of God in the Bible. We are sons of God in, in the Christian sense. If the Christians call themselves sons and daughters of God all the time. So the sons of God, uh, there are many throughout the Bible. And even if we look at Matthew chapter 23 and uh, verse 28, we'll see very clearly that the disciples understood this, that Jesus and God were different. Paul believed that believed to be the author of some 13 or 14 letters of the Bible. We, we cannot be 100% sure of that because many of the books are anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. But it has been suggested by scholars that at least 13 or 14 of these books were written by Paul. For Paul, God's first creation was Jesus. Now this is where we come to interesting theology within Christianity that not even Christians know. According to Paul's writing, Jesus was the first creation. There is a teaching amongst the, the church, and, and not all Christian denominations believe this, but the, a large majority of them do, that Jesus pre-existed. In other words, Jesus existed before he was born on planet Earth uh, 2,000 odd years ago. They believe that he was the first of creation. Different denominations have different ways of explaining this. But even if that was true, even if Jesus was the first creation, even if he pre-existed before all the other creations were created, even if he was created before the other prophets, does that somehow mean he's God? Do we believe that, that Gabriel or Shaitan or Adam or any of these are God because they were created? No, they are created. The very word says that they are able to be uncreated. They are able to be destroyed or die. So that does not mean because Jesus may have existed pre-humanly or before humans were created that he is somehow a God. That just means, wow, this is amazing. This is uh, interesting. But it does not mean any way, in any way, shape or form that he is God. So it is often misunderstood that because someone or he, 
existed before that he has somehow got. That's, that's not possible, it's not feasible. But if we have a look at the teachings of Jesus himself, as we look in John chapter 14 and verse 28 in the, in the Bible, it, this is the, one of the Gospels, it's one of the texts that Christians put the most uh, trust in. They put Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the books that they trust the most. John, of course, where we have the famous John 3.16 from. But in John chapter 14, verse 28, it says that the Father, this is Jesus speaking, is greater than I. In other words, the same, remember, that Paul calls God Father. Many Christians today call God Father. Many of the people throughout the times of, of, of the, the prophets called God Father. So Father is just an expression of, of respect. So you could actually say Jesus was saying Allah is greater than I. Of course, this was a statement that he would have to make because he understood that Allah is greater than he was. So in John chapter 14 and verse 28, he understood that. And Paul declares that the head of every woman, this is Paul now speaking in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. You know, sometimes before I go any further, many people don't understand that, that, that the teachings of Christendom have women at a lesser role. They think that Christianity is liberating women. Islam liberated women. Islam gave women the same rights as, as men. But we see in this verse here, for example, Paul declares that the head of every woman is a husband, and the head of every man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. But we're not going to get into the woman part now, we're just going to have a look at this part. And that is, Jesus understood that the head of him was God, that God was above him, that he was nowhere near equal. He was much more uh, subservient, much lower down. So I hope we've... Uh, been able to get some of the qualities of what uh, um, Paul understood about Jesus and God. He respected Jesus in every way. He understood that the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, was a great messenger. But he no way thought that the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, was Allah or God. We will continue in this series when we meet again on looking at some of the other disciples. What did they see and how did Paul and these disciples get on? We can see here that uh, Paul understood quite clearly that Jesus was not God. He understood that God was a totally separate to, to Jesus, was totally separate in every way, and that Jesus himself declares that uh, I'm lesser, that, uh, that Allah is greater than I, John 14. So we can see clearly that the Quran taught that Allah is one and only, la ilaha illallah, and we finish it by saying Muhammadur Rasulullah, that there is no other God worthy of worship other than Allah. And then, inshallah, when we meet again, we go on to continue in this topic, we'll be able to look at even more information to prove that, that the statement that we say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah is true. Assalamu alaikum.